We are starting a series on the Pilgrim's Progress today by John Bunyan. Last week, Dane gave you an excellent biographical introduction uh, to Bunyan. Since I wasn't able to be here, I really appreciate that work. That saves me some time today, and he did a better job with that than I would have. So today, my goal is just to, to talk to you a little bit about this course of study, um, introduce the work, give you some things that I hope will be helpful to you in reading the work uh, for greater profit, um, and then we're going to go over the author's apology. Now, some of your editions will have the apology in it, and some of them will not. And I'm also going to talk to you about some of the differences in the different editions that you see. And, um, and a lot of you have been asking me for several weeks now, how much am I supposed to read? What's the schedule for reading? Uh, we're going to try and address all of that. But if I don't address your specific question in that regard, please feel free to raise your hand and let me know, and I'll, I'll do my best. All right? Let's start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Gracious God and Father, we're thankful that it is the Lord's Day, a day of feasting and rejoicing, a day of worship, and when we may uh, rest and revel in the rest that we have in your Son. We thank you, O oh God, for this time of Christian education. We pray that you would bless our children uh, in classes throughout the building, O oh God, that you would continue to form Christ within them, and that he would be formed within us all. Bless us in this class as we undertake a study of an inarguably great work of literature. We pray, O oh God, that we would see Christ in this story and that we would see ourselves and that we would be helped in our walk as we seek to walk by faith as pilgrims in this life. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's start with some preliminaries <clears throat> in terms of this course and its aims. Uh, we've wanted to do a class like this for several years. This is but one of several works that I hope eventually to take you through. I did not prepare a biblical defense of studying a non-biblical book in a Sunday school class. And I, it occurred to me about five minutes ago that somebody might actually want that. So if you want that, you can ask me about it. Uh, I make no apologies for it. Um, the Pilgrim's Progress is without question the second greatest selling, best-selling, best-known, best-loved Christian book apart from the Bible in the history of the world, right? And so it's been around for 400 years, and uh, yet it has been blessing God's people f basically from the time that it was printed. Um, there is not a published schedule for this class, largely because I want to get through the first several weeks and see at what pace we're able to move. My expectation is that covering parts one and two are going to take us most of this year. And that is because inevitably we'll have a couple of breaks. Uh, they won't be long, but little interruptions along the way. We will also, on the first Lord's Day of every month, not counting February because of our congregational meeting, we'll be having our Q&A. Uh, so we'll continue that through the year. So I'm expecting this is going to take us most of the year, but I really don't want kind of a schedule to artificially hasten us through this. I don't want to go so slow that we get bogged down, you lose kind of the overall picture of the story. But the Pilgrim's Progress rewar rewards rereading. Uh, I read this book at least once every year and have done so for most of my adult life. Um, it is a book that the more often you read it, the more you're going to see, the more you're going to appreciate, the better able you will be to cr critique some aspects of it and to recognize where there are some debatable uh, images and presentations. So there's not a reading schedule. In the online resource folder, I do have some of my notes available. Um, these notes are going to be multiple pages, like today's, I think, is a three-page handout. Some weeks I might print those out, but honestly, I'm not planning to because that's going to be a lot more printing, a lot more stapling. We've done that for a bunch of other studies, both in Sunday school and Wednesday nights. I already print and staple and fold a lot every week, uh, so I'm not planning to do that here. The other issue is that I want to share with you excerpts from the book. We're not going to read the entire book aloud. We're not going to cover every single line and every single passage, um, but I want to take you to the text frequently, and because we don't have a common text, we didn't require you to buy the same edition, so we don't have page numbers to refer to. I'll talk about why in just a second. I'm going to use the PowerPoint. Those slides are also in the online resource folder. So you can follow along on your phone, on your tablet. You can print them out at home. If you can't do any of those things and you need me to print you a copy, I can, but they're there so that I don't have to print you know, 100 copies for you all. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the various editions of the book. Uh, there are many different editions of The Pilgrim's Progress. My favorite one, which is not nearly the nicest that you can buy, is an old Bantam paperback 
that you'll notice has got red duct tape on it because when you reread it every year, after a while it begins to fall apart. This one's heavily annotated. It's got all of the death speeches in part two uh, underlined. Um, and if you can get through that section without tearing up, then you're a better man than I am. And uh, this is the copy that always goes with me to the hospital whenever I'm in the hospital or one of my kids is in the hospital, which for the last 12 or 13 years has been a lot. So it's been in the hospital a, whole, a bunch of times. Um, that's my favorite copy. Now, this is a complete unabridged edition, but it's going to be a little bit different from this Penguin Classics critical text that has some more scholarly introductions and footnotes and preserves the original spelling, the original italicization. Bunyan was very idiosyncratic in the way he italicized this book, but he did it on purpose, and most of your editions will not include that. So a more scholarly edition like this is going to have that. Uh, various other, you know, kind of apparatus that, uh, that are going to be helpful. These two editions are going to be a little bit different. Why is that? Well, because Bunyan published part one of this book in 1678 and published at least ten editions that we know of during his lifetime. And then there were some further corrections since then. And because it's long ago been in the public domain, if you get on Amazon and you buy a copy of the Pilgrim's Progress, honestly, there's no telling what you're getting, right? So this is why we said in the email several days ago, you do need to be careful. I gave you some links. There are some good online versions that are original or original-ish. But uh, many of the additions, they're going to change the spelling because some words, the way he spelled them is not the way you spell those same words and it's confusing. They're going to change the use of italics. They're going to change uh, the punctuation because Bunyan did not punctuate the way that we do today. And that's not only because he lived 400 years ago, 350 years ago, but it's also because he was a tinker. He was an uneducated man. And so he was not writing as a scholar. He was writing as an ordinary blue collar man that had been gifted by the spirit of God. Um, that's why also when you order a copy of Pilgrim's Progress online, um, you might get uh, parts one and two, uh, or you might get just part one. Many of the editions have only got part one. In fact, I, over the years, I have found several of you have told me I didn't even know there was a part two. Well, part two was published in 1684, and it went through at least two different editions before Bunyan died. So there are multiple editions, depending on which text the publisher is drawing from, depending on how much monkeying he did with the original text. You also have modernized versions, and the modernized version, sometimes modernization simply means we're going to spell that word the way that you spell it today. And we're going to put the periods where they ought to go. And we're going to take out the italics. That may be all the modernization that happens. Or it might be a paraphrase. And you'll find both online, right? So sometimes the Pilgrim's Progress that you buy is just a lightly touched up, edited version of what Bunyan wrote. Sometimes it's basically someone else's version of what he thinks the Pilgrim's Progress ought to be. So you have to be a little bit careful. Now, I say all of that to say this, which I've told a number of you several times. We intentionally did not pick a particular edition and say, buy this one so that I can tell you to be on this page. Because I don't, don't want to have to tell you, you know, buy this book that's $15 and if you, multiple members of your family, each one of you need it. No, don't worry about that. If you are reading a copy of Pilgrim's Progress that is, you know, reasonably original and unabridged, you're going to be perfectly fine. Quite honestly, if you're reading a paraphrase, you're probably going to be fine in this class because I'm going to give you the text that we're actually going to talk about. So um, although I don't recommend that you read paraphrases of this story, although I don't recommend that you use heavily marked up modernized versions of it, I realize that if you do that, it's kind of like a gateway drug. It's an entry point. It gets you familiar with the story. A lot of people, many of you have told me, you have difficulty reading this book. And the reason you have difficulty reading this book is because the words are spelled weird and the, uh, the text, the syntax is arranged very differently. It's kind of a halfway between prose and poetry in a lot of places. Uh, and again, depending on which text you're looking at, it looks very different than any other book that you've read. But the more familiar you are with the story, the easier it is to read. And great literature is always this way, right? The more you read the Bible, the better able you are to read the Bible. The more you read Plato's Republic, the better able you are to read Plato's Republic. The more you read the Pilgrim's Progress, the better able you are to read Pilgrim's Progress. So if it's reading a modernized or abridged or even a paraphrased version, but it's helping you kind of learn the story, I think, you know, that's a good thing. That's a good thing, and I'm hoping that that kind of graduates you into maybe a, you know, a more grown-up version of it. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, 
1678, part one comes out. 1684, uh, the second part comes out. Uh, part two is, uh, well, it's basically got my favorite sections of the story. Although, I mean, how can you say that? Because part one's great. Like, the whole book is magnificent. Um, but part two has a corporate and more highly ecclesiological awareness of Christianity than part one demonstrates. I think part two actually helps correct some of the ways that part one is read or maybe misread. Um, you know, Bunyan was a nonconformist, and so he had some differences in, in, with, with us, but he was also deeply reformed. And so his understanding of salvation is the same, but his view of the church, sometimes there might be some differences. I think part two actually helps to, to, to uh, um, lessen that gap between his, his faith and ours. Um, obviously, the book, the story, is drawing heavily upon that 12-year imprisonment uh, that uh, Dane told you about last week. Bunyan was in prison for 12 years. It's not like he's in the stocks. It's not like he's down in a deep dungeon being flogged twice every day, you know, morning and evening. But he is in prison uh, for preaching without a license for 12 years. Uh, part one is, is written and released six years after his release. So it's a little bit in the past. But during that six years, he's been incarcer incarcerated again for six months of those six years. So uh, prison is very familiar to Bunyan. This is something that he's very well acquainted with. And the imagery of the story clearly draws on this, even to the point of seeing at the very beginning, it'll be on page one, of, of every edition of your story, uh, when, when he finds a den or a gaol, he's finding a jail, right? And, and he is, this dream is coming to him as it were in the jail, right? And so that, that's going to be important throughout the story. Um, one of the books that he also, remember Bunyan's an uneducated man. He didn't go to seminary. Uh, he doesn't read the original languages, but he is a Bible man. He has read the Bible so much that as Spurgeon famously said, if you prick him anywhere, he will bleed bibline, right? So he's just bleeding Bible. Um, what, one of the things that makes Pilgrim's Progress difficult for a lot of people is how um, uninformed, how ignorant they are of the Bible. Right, so, so uh, Pilgrim's Progress is like reading the book of Revelation. The better you know the scriptures, the better able you will be to read the book of Revelation. Revelation is the most uh, Old Testament-centric book in the New Testament, but it doesn't directly quote the Old Testament anywhere. And so consequently, if you don't know the Old Testament really well, you just think it's weird. And if you know the Old Testament really weird, really well, rather, you're, you're reading Revelation and you're saying Zechariah, Ezekiel, Exodus, Psalms, Exodus again, right? And, and you're just like, you're just seeing the Old Testament on, in every paragraph, on every page. Well, that's the way that Pilgrim's Progress is. The better you know the Bible, the better able you will be to read the Pilgrim's Progress because he's not only quoting, he does that frequently, but he is using allusions to scripture, to scriptural language, to scriptural things, to scriptural imagery. Um, he's called to preaching ministry, uh, again, as an uneducated tinker, but he is a voracious Bible reader. And that really comes across in the story. The other book that he's really fed himself upon during his 12-year imprisonment was Fox's Book of Martyrs. Now, it's, that's what we call it. That wasn't the title in his day. But Fox's Book of Martyrs is an explicitly Protestant work. But it goes all the way back to the early church. If you've never read Fox's Book of Martyrs, I, I recommend it. Right? Bunyan would recommend it. Uh, it's a good work. And it, and it kind of orients Bunyan in his imprisonment and in his faith, right, in his suffering for his faith and for his preaching ministry, it orients his thinking in terms of martyrdom, in terms of pilgrimage. Now, I'm going to talk multiple times during this series of studies about ways that I think the Pilgrim's Progress could kind of land us in the ditch of a quasi-Gnostic kind of escapist, kind of otherworldly spirituality, R2K view of Christianity. I'm not persuaded that that's Bunyan's view at all, but I understand why his work could be read that way. But you have to remember the circumstances of his work. You have to remember this man has been in prison multiple times. This man is constantly under threat of being taken from his family, taken from his congregation, locked up, because the magistrate says you don't have the proper license to preach. And so that is kind of situating Bunyan's perspective. I want you to think about how would a Christian in North Korea or Eritrea or Sudan read the Pilgrim's Progress compared to a Christian in Arizona, right? That there's a difference. 
there's a difference. So you've got to interpret it in light of that context. Theologically, he is unashamedly Protestant. Uh, you're going to see a uh, giant pope here in a little bit. Um, and he is a giant, right? Um, he's very Calvinistic. He's very self-consciously reformed. And uh, so you are going to see all of those great doctrines of grace and faith uh, that, you, that you love in this story. Let me talk to you a little bit about the tale. Part one involves a man named Christian who knows, uh, you have to have read the story carefully to know this. What was his name before he was converted? Anybody remember? Graceless. That's right. So his name was once Graceless, but in the story he has the name Christian. Uh, he awakens to his lost condition, to the judgment that is going to befall his home uh, in the city of destruction where he lives. And he flees. He pleads with his family, but they will not go with him. And so he flees the city, uh, guided by instructions from a character named Evangelist, and also with instructions from a little book or a little scroll that's given to him. He undertakes a quest to go to the celestial city. And so the story in part one is just the story of his pilgrimage. It's the various characters that he meets along the way, the experiences that he has, and the suffering that he endures, which is considerable. Part two, that fewer of you have read, is the story of his wife and children, right? His wife and sons. Christiana is her name after her conversion. She had initially refused to go, uh, but she awakens also to faith, leaves the city of destruction, journeys to the celestial city, visits many of the same places that her husband had visited in part one. She's also accompanied by a companion named Mercy, and uh, her, she's, she's a beautiful part of the story. Um, her story really advances part one. So it's, it's not, you know, and I think this is why, I'm guessing, publishers don't publish part two always, is the more pages you have, the more expensive the book is to produce. And like, who needs part two because she's just doing the same things that they did in part one. That is, that is an evidence of an editor who did not read carefully, right? Reminds me of the editor who, uh, who uh, several years ago was spoofed. Someone sent in a copy of Pride and Prejudice, submitted it as a manuscript with a different title page and a different author's name on it, and the editor rejected it. Right? It's like, okay, there's an editor who needs to lose his job, right? Um, because if you can't recognize that Pride and Prejudice is a great work of literature, like how do you, how do you become a book editor and you've never read Pride and Prejudice, first of all, right? But um, anyway, I digress. Part two is not just a repetition of part one. There is a repetition of, of kind of this pilgrim theme, and, and she goes to many of the same places, but the differences are really important. You're going to see some places that were strongholds of evil in her husband's quest that are now being torn down during Christiana's experience. So there's kind of a very post-mill feel uh, to part two, and it's also, like I said, more ecclesiological ecclesiologically aware. Um, it fills out the allegory as well. Um, you, you're going to see more characters, more faithful characters. In part one, you feel like, boy, those, those elect, they're really, they really are a remnant. Like there's, there's two or three of you that make it and, and everybody else is, is a reprobate. Part two is not that way at all. So it's, it's an important uh, addition and complement to part one. Now, the Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory an allegory is not typology, it is not metaphor, it is not simile, although all of those literary categories are closely adjacent to one another. Right? You could argue that they're even different types of the same kind of symbolic representation. Allegory is a more substantial symbolic representation. It's not just foreshadowing, it's not just comparison, but it is direct representation. This for this. Right? This means that. And in Bunyan's case, this is, he's using something that's called named allegory, which is a very simple, it's kind of a paint-by-numbers allegory. This is why little children can follow Pilgrim's Progress. It's you adults that have a problem with it. Right? So little children can follow Pilgrim's Progress. It's fantastic. It's an exciting story. And everybody knows who everyone else is because they're, of their name. Your name is a statement of your character. Your name is a statement of your identity and of your destiny, right? So you meet people like Christian, mercy, hopeful, faithful, right? Evangelist, interpreter, right? You also meet people like talkative, Mr. Worldly Wiseman, right? Um, Mr. Ready to Halt, Mr. Valiant for Truth, Mr. Greatheart, oh, oh, many great characters, okay? So not all symbolic literature 
is allegory. Uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, for example, not allegory. It is full of Christian themes and types, but not allegory. Okay? That would be a mis mistake in interpretation. Lord of the Rings is a Christian myth. It is not allegory. It's full of Christian theology, right? Uh, much more so, much more robustly, by the way, than Chronicles of Narnia, right? Uh, the Lord of the Rings is a deeply Christian book, um, but not allegory. Pilgrim's Progress is allegory. So when you're reading Narnia, when you're reading Lord of the Rings, you need to set this alongside of them. If you're only going to read three things outside of the Bible for the rest of your life, let it be those, those three sets um, and put orthodoxy in there somewhere. <laughs> Pilgrim's Progress is meant to be a type of instructional fiction, right? Bunyan's going to say this explicitly in the, in the uh, apology that we're about to look at. He wants you to see these characters and events having direct parallel and direct significance for your own life. You are going to meet yourself in this story. You are going to meet characters, you are going to see events, and you're going to say, there I am, right? You're also going to see each other. Be careful and charitable. <laughs> like, don't just, you're reading Pilgrim's Progress and you're like, <laughs> right? don't do that, don't do that, right? You will be able to see yourself, and again, the more familiar you are with the story, the more often you're going to meet yourself, because it's not going to be just one character. You, you should not, you, you know, like, don't come to me and say, I'm the man in the iron cage. It's like, well, you don't have to be, right? Um, you, it's not one character, right? It's, it's shades of different characters, and you're like, oh, you know, today I'm, I'm a little bit like Mr. Worldly Wiseman, right? I'm a little bit like Legalist today. I, I'm a little bit like Mr. Talkative today. You know, wh whatever it is, and, and you're going to see yourself and your life reflected in that story. Uh, the allegory rewards rereading re, re because the features and themes become clearer as you do so. Um, Alexander the Great famously slept with the Iliad and a dagger under his pillow at night. Uh, Bunyan's going to make a reference to the pillow here in a minute. I don't know if he's deliberately echoing that or not. Bunyan scholar could probably answer that. But, um, but I will say, this is the book I think you should sleep on, uh, with under your pillow. This is the Christian's odyssey. This, th this is the odyssey, right? So Christian is Ulysses, and he's, and he's trying to get home, right? And this is, the, this is the myth that tells us who we are, that tells us how we're supposed to live. So the Greeks had, you know, Odysseus and the heroes of the Iliad. We have the Pilgrim's Progress and Scripture, right? Um, some key things to pay attention to, and that we could multiply this many times over, but here are five that I think are really important to understanding the story. First, repentance. This is a dominant theme in the story. The need to flee from the judgment to come, to forsake the world, the flesh, and the devil, is a dominant note that runs through the entire narrative. Christian's pilgrimage shows us what Luther affirmed in the first of his 95 theses, and that is that the believer's life is to be one entirely of repentance. It's not, it doesn't happen just at the beginning of the story. You, you don't have this conversion experience, and then Christian is done repenting. He's repenting literally until he dies. Spoiler alert. He dies at the end of the story, and that's the beginning of everything good in the story. Right? Number two, memory. This may be the key thing in the book. The need to remember evangelist warnings, the contents of the little book, to keep the little book with you at all times, the instructions that the pilgrims receive is constantly, they are being exhorted to remember these things. Go over it, keep repeating them to yourself, right? And part two elaborates on that theme by showing even Christiana's children being catechized along the way. Catechesis is part of the way that we remember the truths that guide us to the celestial city. Number three, fear. Fear appears many times in multiple ways in the story. It's, it's not at all a simplistic presentation of fear. It's an incredibly nuanced one. There's fear of judgment and fear of God, fear of the recriminations of one's friends, fear of danger on the way, and maybe the most instructive, Christian's fear of death at the end of part one. Christian is afraid to die. And he has a moment almost of despair as he's passing the river. And that is super helpful because you are going to be like Christian sometimes. You are going to be the Christian who has no reason for fear and has been delivered by Jesus from slavery to fear and you are going to be afraid. 
right? God has not given us a spirit of fear, so feel guilty and ashamed of your fear. Well, no, just repent of your fear and trust God. But Christian feels that fear too. The portrayal of fear is very complex and very, very helpful, I think. Number four, faithfulness. Faithfulness is tremendously important in this story. Faithfulness to one's calling to follow Christ, faithfulness to God's word as it's revealed, faithfulness to one's friends, and being faithful to death, which is an overriding theme in this story, being faithful even to the point of death, uh, even in the city of Vanity Fair, when faithful is, right, where he is. Uh, The Pilgrim's Progress graphically illustrates that faith begets faithfulness or it is not saving. It's telling you, I'm just warning you, right? If you're an antinomian, you are going to hate this story. No one is saved unless he is faithful to the end. One of the themes that we could have put on this list is the theme of apostasy. You see it a lot in this story. It's a real thing. Bunyan doesn't think it's a hypothetical category because it's not, right? And then fifth and finally, companionship. And again, this is brought out even more clearly in part two, but it's there in part one as well. The blessings and the dangers of companionship are shown repeatedly in the story. If anything, I would say part one illustrates the problem of the wrong kind of companions, and part two emphasizes the blessing of the right kind of companions, right? So uh, Proverbs 13, 20, he who walks with wise men will be wise, that's part two, but the companion of fools will be destroyed, that's part one. Um, some, of the Christ- some of Christian's greatest help and greatest hindrances come through interaction with other characters. And so in part two, we see that the community of faith And the role of the church in the believer's earthly pilgrimage is an important part of our journey to the city as well. It focuses on Christiana, a woman, a wife, a mother, who is led, saved, and served by strong Christ characters. So who does Christiana represent? It's not just the ladies in the church. She represents the church because the church is the woman, wife, mother of the faithful, right? And, and she's being brought to the celestial city uh, by Christ. Okay, um, let me give you some cautions uh, about reading the book, and we'll have a lot more to say about this as we go through it. Uh, first of all, interpret the story by means of Scripture and you know, theological truth that you've gleaned from Scripture, not vice versa. Don't interpret the Bible in terms of Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, interpret Pilgrim's Progress in terms of the Bible. It is magnificent. It has certainly been used by God to bless many generations, but it's not the Bible. It's not infallible. Some parts of the story can be interpreted in various ways. I will just tell you, you may disagree with the way that I interpret some parts of it. Bunyan might disagree with some ways that I interpret it. I hope not, but, but it's possible. But be careful of being too dogmatic in what you think a particular passage or image signifies. Right? Some of you are going to think that... that um, uh, Christian is not saved until his burden falls off of him at the cross. And I'm going to argue that you're wrong. I'm going to argue that you're misreading the story. But it's a plausible reading. It's probably a pretty common reading. Um, I'm going to tell you why I think it's the wrong reading, and it's, it's part because I'm reading the story in light of Scripture, not Scripture in light of the story. At the same time, we know Bunyan's theology very well. We can be reasonably sure of how he meant it to be read, and even then we might quibble with some parts, but we want to interpret it faithfully in view of the author's intent. Use Scripture to interpret the story and its features. At the same time, let works of Christian imagination open your mind to other ways of reading Scripture than you might have considered before. Uh, This is one of the overriding, overwhelming ways in which reading Christian authors... um, like Bunyan, like Lewis, like Tolkien, um, Chesterton. This is is one of the ways they can be helpful, is although you're not reading Scripture in light of the Pilgrim's Progress, there are some things in the Pilgrim's Progress that might help you read Scripture better. Uh, And and the, the one thing that, there's many examples of this, but one that comes to my mind over and over because it's the passage I get asked about more than any other is the man in the iron cage. And people start reading Pilgrim's Progress because they hear me talking about it, and they come to the man in the iron cage, and they are very, you know, confused, fearful, whatever. Um, and they're saying, you know, like, how can that be right? And I'm like, well, like, he's getting it out of this passage, this passage, this passage, this passage. And these are all passages you've read, but you've never considered in that way. But maybe seeing it portrayed emblematically in Pilgrim's Progress helps you go back to Scripture and say, what if? What if, right, there is this category? Um, read the story like a Christian, not like a Gnostic. 
Now, what do I mean by that? It is easy to read the Pilgrim's Progress in a separatist, hyper-fundamentalist, escapist, and semi-gnostic manner. And some parts lend themselves to that, not, not necessarily to say that that's the way Bunyan meant that, but it's just you can easily see, like, what are we trying to do? We're trying to just throw this world away, get out of the city of destruction, and flee to heaven. We just want to get to heaven, right? Uh, it almost becomes like a dispen dispensationalist tale at that point. Um, but when you, when you realize Bunyan's experience is of sitting in prison because he's not allowed to preach, being away from his family because the magistrate didn't give him permission to preach. You can understand why he's saying the world is part of the enemy. It's part of what has to be repented of and put behind us. The story should be read in an orthodox way. The earth is not the enemy. The world is. The evil in the world is. Do you understand the distinction I'm making? We're not trying to escape the planet. But the world, insofar as all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. That's the problem, right? Heaven is not ultimately an escape, but a destination and consummation of hope. So let the story be what it is without trying to force an exhaustive theology on it or from it. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that, you know, well, at the end of the Pilgrim's Progress, it's all wrong because instead of going to heaven, the celestial city is supposed to come down and redeem and restore and transform the city of destruction. Well, yeah, that's, like, I think that's what's going to happen. That's not what happens in the story. I think that's what happens in the Bible. I think that's what happens in our future. That's not what happens in this story. Let the story be what it is. It's not meant to be a complete theology. There are many aspects of the Christian faith and life that are not represented here. And remember that the political and historical context of Bunyan's suffering is crucial to reading it rightly. What would it mean to one of our brothers in Eritrea who has been in prison in Eritrea for 20 years for preaching the gospel? Um, in the online resource folder, I give you an outline of the book, right? Part one has 10 stages. Part two has eight stages. General summaries that you'll find printed in some editions of the book uh, there, but I'll let you look at that yourself. Now, let's go to the apology. Um, some of your editions are going to include the author's apology, and if it's there, of course you should read it. Of course you should read it. Um, no, it's not the start of the story. It's Bunyan defending why he's telling you the story in the way that he is. This is, this is his apology, his apologia, his defense. It's, he's not apologizing for it. He's defending it. He's presenting, he's saying, this is, this is how it came about. And the question is, well, well, John, why did you write this silly tale, this children's book, instead of some kind of a serious theological work, which by this time he had already written a number of them. He was a, he was a voluminous writer. Well, I'm not going to give you the entire text of the Apology. That, that's pretty long. But I am going to give you some, some sections that I think are helpful in understanding things that will benefit you in reading the work. He, first of all, set out to write something else. He says, when at the first I took my pen in hand, thus for to write, I did not understand that I at all should make a little book in such a mode, nay, I had undertook to make another, which when almost done, before I was aware, I this begun. He's sitting down to write something else, and then it's as if the muses take his hand and he's writing something. Now, we're not talking about pagan, occult, automatic writing here. But, and I will say this cautiously, but I will say it nonetheless, the only way I know to explain the beauty, the depth, the profundity, and the preservation of certain works in the canon of tradition is a type of, we need a different word than inspiration, right? But a lowercase, not canonical, not infallible, but nonetheless providentially provided and preserved work of God. Right? Now, how much of this is just Bunyan being poetic, right? And how much of this is, is actually true? I cannot tell you how many sermons I sat down to write one way and I ended up with something else, right? And what, what resulted here, like how many of Bunyan's other works have you ever read? Most of you haven't read any, right? A couple of you have probably read some others. Dane's probably read a lot of the others. But most of you have never read any of Bunyan's other works, but all of you know something about this work. And I don't know how to explain that other than God 
was at work in and through Bunyan. That doesn't mean we need to add it to the canon of Scripture. We don't need to treat it as infallible Scripture. But you do need to appreciate the, the fact that God is providentially at work in this. He says, And thus it was, I writing of the way and race of saints in our gospel day, fell suddenly into an allegory about their journey and the way to glory. In more than twenty things which I set down, this done I twenty more had in my crown, and they again began to multiply like sparks that from the coals of fire do fly. Notice he says, I fell into an allegory, and it basically wrote itself. It's like he's saying, don't blame me. Like, I, didn't, I didn't mean to do this, you know. I just threw the, fire, the gold into the fire, and out popped this calf, you know. Um, and again, how much of that is just like Bunyan being, you know, kind of poetically witty, and how much of it is true that, like, Bunyan does, in fact, go on to write some other allegorical works. Mr. Badman, which he writes between part one and part two, uh, The Holy War, right, uh, and The Battle for Man's Soul, right? So Bunyan writes some other allegorical works, but, but a, apparently, like, depending on how seriously we take this part of the apology, that wasn't necessarily what he had originally set out. Like, that wasn't necessarily his ambition, but, but it comes to him, and, and under the form of a dream is how he represents it, uh, that, that this might be a helpful thing. And it almost writes itself, because as soon as he starts, it's just, I've got 20 things in my head, and as soon as I get those 20 th- things down, there are 20 more that are coming. And, it's, and it, just, it, it just flows from him, right, uh, and, and becomes something that has blessed the church for 350 years. He says... Well, when I had thus put mine ends together, I showed them to others that I might see whether they would condemn them or them justify. And some said, let them live. Some let them die. Some said, John, print it. Others said, not so. Some said, it might do good. Others said, no. If you can't see that Bunyan has a poetic wit, and this is important to see because there are things that Bunyan has written, like grace abounding, uh, wow, wow. This is his autobiography, and you want to just, like, take him by the hand and say, brother, like, have some peace. Uh, Bunyan's journey to assurance of grace is agonizing. And and I think he would say his journey to conversion is agonizing, right? Um, It's agonizing. And so, you know, it's very easy to kind of sit uh, and read certain things by Bunyan and imagine him as this very stuffy, stiff-collared Puritan who is in all the worst ways puritanical. I'm sorry. Like, Lewis... Lewis corrected the history books on this. He says the, the stuffiness was on the other side. It was the papists that were the stuffy, proud Pharisees, and the Puritans were the ones who were jovially enjoying life. They really were. And Bunyan, if you, if you don't read the allegory, you might not realize he means this story in places to be just downright funny. And if you can read this story without being moved to laughter and without sometimes being moved to tears, again, like you're, you're reading it in a, the worst kind of puritanical way, right? Read it like a Puritan, right? And laugh and weep and celebrate and, you know, all, all of that. He says, now, now was I in a strait and did not see which was the best thing to be done by me. At last I thought, since ye are thus divided, I print it will. And so the case decided. What if he had not? Can you imagine? Like, what if he had not? Well, it's a good thing God didn't leave it up to him, right? Now, he defends at several points in this apology. I'm going to try and keep this big enough for you to see, uh, but this one may be hard. I'm sorry. Um, I was trying to put the sections together that that belong together. Um, He defends in a couple of different places in this apology the use of this type of imagery, and he appeals to the Bible, not arguing that the Bible is using allegorical narrative, right? There's no fiction in Scripture, but the way in which images are used is justification for his tale. He says, and this is picking up in the middle of a line, but he says, were not God's laws, his gospel laws, in olden time held forth by type, shadows, and metaphors, yet loath will any sober man be to find fault with them, lest he be found for to assault the highest wisdom. No, he rather stoops and seeks to find out what, by pins and loops, by calves and sheep, by heifers and by rams, by birds and herbs, and by the blood of lambs, God speaketh to him, and happy is he that finds the light and grace that in them be. In other words, he's saying, look, the Bible is just full of this kind of thing. And it's not about pins and loops and calves and sheep and heifers and rams and birds and herbs and blood of lambs. Like God is speaking 
by those images, and you have to ask yourself, what does that mean? What is that referring to? And that's the way you got to read the Pilgrim's Progress, right? So he gives kind of three points at the end of the apology in defending the work, and here is the second. He says, I find that men as high as trees will write, dialogue-wise, yet no man doth them slight for writing so. Indeed, if they abuse truth, cursed be they, and the craft they use to that intent. But yet let truth be free to make her sallies upon thee and me, which way it pleases God, for who knows how, better than he that taught us first to plow, to guide our minds and pens for his designs, and he makes base things usher in divine." Now, this is an interesting point. He says the people who are going to criticize allegory don't criticize this highfalutin verbiage in all kinds of serious theological works. I have, like, you know, how many books do you have? More than I need, less than I want, right? It's the perpetual problem. I have a decent library, right? I have a lot of serious theological works. And I would rather read Pilgrim's Progress any day, every day. There's a reason that I reread this book and Lewis and Chesterton and Tolkien every year, repeatedly throughout the year, and I don't reread some of those theology books. Like, I've got a bunch of theology books in my, on my shelves that I'll never read from cover to cover. They're there for reference. If you think you're supposed to read everything in your library, you don't know what a library's for. <laughs> and in other books that I'll reread, I'll read them once and I'll never reread them. But I'll reread Bunyan until I cross the river, right? And, and if I can't read it to myself, I hope... My children or grandchildren love me enough to come and read it aloud to me, right? Like, make sure you do. Right? So, um, and he's saying that a lot of people who would poo-poo this kind of, I mean, like I've had, and I'm not trying to call anybody out here, but like I've had Christians who really think, you know, serious Christians shouldn't read fiction. Like, kind of tell that you don't read fiction, you know? So, um, Bunyan's point stands. It's easy for you to criticize the allegorical tale that he's woven for us. You would have no objection to the $5 theological words in an important book of theology that's not going to be read 35 years from now and for sure is not going to be printed 350 years from now. Do you understand that? There's a lot of people writing serious academic works sitting in judgment of Bunyan, Lewis, and Tolkien who are not going to be read one generation beyond their death. People are still going to be reading this until Jesus returns, which is like thousands of years from now. Number three, he says this, I find that holy writ in many places hath semblance with this method where the cases do call for one thing to set forth. Use it I may then, and yet nothing smother truth's golden beams. Nay, by this method may, may it cast forth its rays as light as day. Rather than smothering or obscuring the truth, this method is going to be used by God to manifest the truth, and it really will. There are things that Bunyan is going to teach you in an allegorical myth that are right there in your Bible and have been in your Bible for 2,000 years, and you've never noticed it. And then you're going to see it in Bunyan, and you're going to go back, and you're going to do your Bible reading, and you're going to say, when did that get in there? (laughs) I'm not kidding. Like Lewis, Tolkien, Chesterton, and Bunyan have helped me see so much more in the Bible than I ever saw. Right? It was always in the Bible, but I'm standing on their shoulders, and they're helping me see it by writing it in, in different ways. So what does the book show? This book, it chalketh out before thine eyes the man that seeks the everlasting prize. It shows you whence he comes, whither he goes, what he leaves undone, also what he does. It also shows you how he runs and runs till he unto the gate of glory comes. That's what the Pilgrim's Progress is about. It's about 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and running the race with purpose, running it to win. Being, living like a Christian like you mean it, like you actually believe Jesus is Lord, like you actually believe all of the things that you say you believe when you recite the Nicene Creed. It shows, too, who set out for life amain as if the lasting crown they would obtain. Here also you may see the reason why they lose their labor and like fools do die. Especially in part one, you're going to see a bunch of people start and not finish well. And guess what? As a Christian living in this world, you already have seen a lot of people start and not finish well. And you're going to see a lot more before you die. And that's one of the reasons you need to read the Pilgrim's Progress, so that you remember not to be that kind of fool. Like, why would you do that? I have asked that question. 
Why, why were you not afraid to do that? Why would, you, why would you finish? Like, you could stand before the Lord at any moment now. You're not a young man. What are you thinking? Seemed right at the time. We need to read Pilgrim's Progress more, right? And if that doesn't sober you, then you're not reading it well. Like Bun- Part of Bunyan's point is to help you see the folly of apostasy. But you must become a traveler. This book will make a traveler of thee, if by its counsel thou wilt rule it be. It will direct thee to the holy land, if thou wilt its directions understand. Yea, it will make the slothful active be, the blind also delightful things to see. I love that section. Right. So he's just telling you up front what you're supposed to do with this story. You're not supposed to just be entertained by it. We need more um, enlightening and edifying entertainment in our lives. We need, more, we need you to read more books that are actually going to make a difference for your soul. I'm not saying that you can only read serious works. I'm not saying that you can't read books that are essentially mind candy. But I am saying that you need to read more entertaining books that are edifying and enlightening, that are good for your soul. You need to learn how to enjoy this. And if you don't enjoy it yet, you need to get to the point that you can enjoy it because it's good for you. It's like eating your vegetables. Art thou for something rare and profitable, or wouldst thou see a truth within a fable? Art thou forgetful, wouldst thou remember from New Year's Day to the last of December? Then read my fancies, they will stick like burrs, and may be to the helpless comforters. You read this book enough, it's going to get into your soul. It's going to stick in your conscience in a good way. It's going to stay with you. It's like a burr, right? It grabs the pad of the saddle and it rides with you, right? Or like these little goat heads things, you know, that stick into our shoes and into our pants and they just go with us wherever we go. Well, the Pilgrim's Progress will be like that. So put it under under your pillow, read. Like this is how you read big books. This is how you read hard books, right? If you would read three pages, three pages of Moby Dick when you wake up in the morning or before you go to bed at night, you would read Moby Dick every year. And a bunch of you have never read Moby Dick, and that's a shame, right? But if you've never read Moby Dick and you've never read Pilgrim's Progress, read Pilgrim's Progress first, please, right? And if you would read a page of Pilgrim's Progress every day before you go to bed, you don't have to sit down and plow through the whole thing, right? You'll enjoy it if you do, but, you know, you don't have to do that. Just read a page. It will stick like a burr. And, and it's going to become something that is constantly with you. You're constantly thinking about your life in light of the myth. This book is writ in such a dialect as may the minds of listless men affect. It seems a novelty and yet contains nothing but sound and honest gospel strains. I like that. So what do you see? Wouldst thou divert thyself from melancholy? Wouldst thou be pleasant yet be far from folly? Wouldst thou read riddles and their explanation, or else be drowned in thy contemplation? Dost thou love picking meat, or wouldst thou see a man in the clouds and hear him speak to thee? Wouldst thou be in a dream and yet not sleep, or wouldst thou in a moment laugh and weep? Wouldst thou lose thyself and catch no harm and find thyself again without a charm? Wouldst thou read thyself and read thou knowest not what? And yet know whether thou art blessed or not by reading the same lines. O then come hither and lay my book, thy head, and heart together. John Bunyan, right? You are going to read, and even if you don't know entirely what you're reading, you are going to learn whether you are blessed or not. You are going to meet yourself in these pages, and it's going to help you be the person you are created to be and called to be. And so take the book. Your head, thinking, and heart, your affections, right? And bring them to the Pilgrim's Progress and adopt this book and start reading it. So, again, if you need to read modernized or abridged or updated or read it a page at a time or don't read it at all and just come to Sunday school, that's, that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. Don't go out and buy, you know, the most scholarly, originally scanned copy and, and just, you know, like, like an ascetic, you know, whipping yourself by reading the pilgrim. No, like this is supposed to be delightful. Come to, t- come to Sunday school. We'll talk about what it means. We'll whet your appetite. We'll make you want to go home and read the story. So tole lege, take, take up and read. All right, we're over time. Let me pray. If you've got questions, come, come talk to me up front. All right.
Gracious God and Father, thank you for the blessing of this morning, for this opportunity to worship, uh, to spend time in the sacrifice of prayer, being met by you, O God, in the means of grace, and now being encouraged by a faithful brother from long ago who has left us with a great story, a Christian myth that is our own story. We pray that it would be a blessing to us all, that you would lead us and bless us through this examination of the Pilgrim's Progress in the weeks and months ahead. We pray in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. 